Walk to Moons, Chapter 22, Evidence. I spent the next night at Phoebe's house, but I could hardly sleep. Phoebe kept saying, hear that noise? And she would jump up to peer out the window in case it was the lunatic returning for the rest of us. Once she saw Mrs. Cadaver in her garden with a flashlight. I must have fallen asleep after that because I awoke to the sound of Phoebe crying in her sleep. When I woke her, she denied it. I was not crying. I most certainly was not. In the morning, Phoebe refused to get up. Her father rushed into the room with two ties slung around his neck and his shoes in his hand. Phoebe, you're late. I'm sick, she said. I have a fever and a stomach ache. Her father placed his hand on her forehead, looked deep into her eyes and said, I am afraid you have to go to school. I'm sick, honest, she said, it might be cancer. Phoebe, I know you're worried, but there's nothing we can do but wait. We have to go on with things. We can't malinger. We can't what, Phoebe said? Malinger, here, look it up. And he tossed her the dictionary from her desk and tore down the hall. My mother is missing and my father hands me a dictionary, Phoebe said. She looked up Malinger and read the definition. To pretend to be ill in order to escape duty or work. And she slammed the book shut. I am not malingering. Prudence was in a frenzy. Where is my white blouse? Phoebe, have you seen? I could have sworn. And she pulled things out of her closet and flung them on the bed. Phoebe reluctantly got dressed, pulling a wrinkled blouse and skirt from the closet. Downstairs, the kitchen table was bare. No bowls of muesli, Phoebe said. No glasses of orange juice or whole wheat toast. And she touched the white sweater hanging on the back of the chair. My mother's favorite white cardigan, she said. She snatched the sweater and waved it in front of her father. Look at this. Would she leave this behind? Would she? He reached forward and touched its sleeve, rubbing the fabric between his fingers for a moment. Phoebe, it's an old sweater. Phoebe put it on over her wrinkled blouse. I was uneasy because everything that happened at Phoebe's that morning reminded me of when my mother left. For weeks, my father and I fumbled around like ducks in a fit. Nothing was where it was supposed to be. The house took on a life of its own, hatching piles of dishes and laundry and newspapers and dust. My father must have said, I'll be jiggered 3,000 times. The chickens were fidgety, the cows were skittish, the pigs were sullen and glum. Our dog, Moody Blue, whimpered for hours on end. When my father said that my mother was not coming back, I refused to believe it. I bought all of her postcards down from my room and said, she wrote me all these, she must be coming back. And just like Phoebe, who waved her mother's sweater in front of her father, I had brought a chicken in from the coop. Would mom leave her favorite chicken? I demanded, she loves this chicken. What I really meant was, how can she not come back to me? She loves me. At school, Phoebe slammed her books on her desk and Beth Ann said, hey, Phoebe, your blouse is a little wrinkled. My mother's away, Phoebe said. I iron my own clothes now, Beth Ann said. I even iron. To me, Phoebe whispered, <clears throat> I think I'm having a genuine heart attack. I thought about a baby rabbit and our, that our dog, Moody Blue, caught and carried around. She was not actually lunching on the rabbit, just playing. I finally coaxed Moody Blue to drop it, and when I picked up the rabbit, its heart was beating faster than anything. Faster and faster it went, and then all of a sudden, its heart stopped. I took the rabbit to my mother, and she said, It's dead, Salamanca. It can't be dead, I said. It was alive just a minute ago. I wondered what would happen if all of a sudden Phoebe's heart beat itself out like the rabbit's and she fell down and died right there at school. Her mother would not even know that Phoebe was dead. After homeroom, Mary Lou said to Phoebe, did I hear you say your mother was away? Christy and Megan gathered around. Is your mother on a business trip? Christy said. My mother's always going to Paris on business trips. So where is your mother? On a business trip? Phoebe nodded. Where did she go, Megan said. Tokyo, Saudi Arabia. Phoebe said, London. Oh, London, Christy said. My mother's been there. 
Phoebe turned to me with a puzzled expression on her face. I think she was surprised at what she had said, but I knew exactly why she had lied. It was easier sometimes. I had done this myself when people asked about my mother. Don't worry, Phoebe, I said. She snapped. I'm not worried. I had done that too. Whenever anyone tried to console me about my mother, I had nearly chomped their heads off. I was a complete ornery old donkey. When my father would say, you must feel terrible, I denied it. I don't, I told him. I don't feel anything at all. But I did feel terrible. I didn't want to wake up in the morning and I was afraid to go to sleep at night. By lunchtime, people were coming at Phoebe from all directions. How long will your mother be in London? Mary Lou asked. Is she having tea with the queen? Tell her to go to Convent Garden, Christy said. My mother just loves Convent Garden. It's Covent Garden, Cabbage Head, Mary Lou said. It isn't, Christy said. I am sure it's Convent Garden. After school, we walked home with Ben and Mary Lou. Phoebe wouldn't say a word. What's the matter, Phoebe? Ben asked. Talk. Out of the blue, I said. Everyone has his own agenda. Ben tripped over the curb and Mary Lou gave me a peculiar look. I kept hoping that Phoebe's mother would be home. Even though the door was locked, I kept hoping. Are you sure you want me to come in? I said, maybe you want to be alone. Phoebe said, I don't want to be alone. Call your dad and see if you can stay for dinner again. Inside, Phoebe called, Mom? And she walked through the house looking in each room. That's it, Phoebe said. I'm going to search for clues, for evidence that the lunatic has been here and dragged my mother off. I wanted to tell her that she was just fishing in the air and that probably her mother had not been kidnapped, but I knew that Phoebe didn't want to hear it. When my mother did not return, I imagined all sorts of things. Maybe she had cancer and didn't want to tell us and was hiding in Idaho. Maybe she got knocked on her head and had amnesia and was wandering around Lewiston not knowing who she really was or thinking she was someone else. My father said, she does not have cancer, Sal. She does not have amnesia. Those are fishes in the air, but I didn't believe him. Maybe he was trying to protect her or me. Phoebe prowled through the house, examining the walls and carpet and searching for blood stains. She found several suspicious spots and unidentifiable hair strands. Phoebe marked the spots with pieces of adhesive tape and collected the hairs in an envelope. Prudence was in a lather when she came home. I made it, she said, I made it. And she was jumping all about. I made cheerleading. When Phoebe reminded her that their mother had been kidnapped, Prudence said, Oh, Phoebe, mom wasn't kidnapped. She stopped jumping and looked around the kitchen. So what are we supposed to have for dinner? Phoebe rubbished around in the cupboards and Prudence opened the freezer compartment and said, look at this. For a terrible moment, I thought she had found some chopped up body parts in there. Maybe, just maybe Phoebe was right. Maybe a lunatic had done away with her mother. I couldn't look. I couldn't hear Prudence moving things in the freezer. At least she wasn't screaming. There were no body parts in the freezer. Instead, stacked neatly were plastic containers, each with a note attached, Brock Len Cast 351 hour, Prudence read, and Mac Cheese 325, 45 minutes, and on and on and on. What's Brock Len Cast, I said. Phoebe pried open the lid. Inside was a green and yellow hardened mass. Broccoli and lentil casserole, she said. When their father came home and was surprised to see dinner on the table, Prudence showed him the freezer contents. Hmm, he said. At dinner, we all ate quietly. I don't suppose you've heard anything from mom? Prudence asked her father. Not yet, he said. I think we should call the police, Phoebe said. Phoebe... I'm serious. I found some suspicious spots. Phoebe pointed toward two adhesive taped areas beneath the dining room table. What's that tape doing down there? He asked. Phoebe explained about the potential blood spots. Blood, Prudence said, and she stopped eating. Phoebe pulled out the envelope and emptied the hair strands on the table. Strange hairs, Phoebe explained. Prudence said, ugh. 
Mr. Winterbottom tapped his fork against his knife. Then he stood up, took Phoebe's arm, and said, follow me. He went to the refrigerator, opened the freezer compartment, and indicated the plastic containers. If your mother had been kidnapped by a lunatic, would she have had time to prepare all these meals? Would she have been able to say, excuse me, Mr. Lunatic, while I prepare 10 or 20 meals for my family to eat while I am kidnapped? You don't care, Phoebe said. Nobody cares. Everyone has his own idiot agenda. I left shortly after dinner. Mr. Winterbottom was in his study, phoning his wife's friends to see if they had any idea of where she might have gone. At least, Phoebe said to me, he's doing something, but I still think we should call the police. As I left Phoebe's, the dead leaf crackly voice of Margaret Cadaver called to me from her house next door. Sal, do you want to come in? Your father's here. We're having dessert. Join us. My father appeared behind her. Come on, Sal, he said, don't be a goose. I'm not a goose, I said. I already had dessert, and I'm going home to work on my English report. My father turned to Margaret. I'd better go with her. Sorry. Margaret didn't say anything. She just stood there as my father retrieved his jacket and joined me. I knew it was mean, but I felt as if I had won a little victory over Margaret Cadaver. On the way home, when Dad asked if Phoebe's mom had come back yet, I said no. Phoebe thinks a lunatic has carried her off. A lunatic? Isn't that a bit far-fetched? That's what I thought at first. But you never know, do you? I mean, it could happen. There could actually be a lunatic who... Sal. I was going to explain about the nervous young man and the mysterious messages, but my father would call me a goose. Instead, I said, how do you know that someone, not exactly a lunatic, but just someone, didn't make mom go to Idaho? Maybe it was blackmail. Sal, your mother went because she wanted to go. We should have stopped her. A person isn't a bird. You can't cage a person. She shouldn't have gone. If she hadn't gone, Sal, I am sure that she intended to come back. We had reached our house, but we didn't go in. We sat on the porch steps and dad said, you can't predict, a person can't foresee, you never know, and he looked away. I felt miserable right along with him. I apologized for being ornery and for upsetting him. He put his arm around me and we sat there together on the porch, two people being completely pitiful and lost.